Prime Minister. Question number one, Mr. Paul Marlon. Number one, sir. Mr. Speaker, sir. This morning I had meetings with ministerial colleagues and others. In addition to my duties in this House, I shall be having further meetings later today. This evening I hope to have an audience of Her Majesty the Queen. Mr. Barlon, uh, is my right honourable friend aware that it's not the principle of the community charge which is causing concern, but the amounts, but the amounts that Liberal and Labour-controlled councils are asking people to pay? Is my right honourable friend further aware that the Gloucestershire County Council, controlled by the Liberals, has just set its community charge level? and has seriously breached all the government guidelines in spending. Will my right honourable friend, without delay, set in motion the mechanism to charge cap Gloucestershire? Yeah, yeah. Yeah, yeah. Uh, uh, Mr Speaker, I'm aware of the position in Gloucestershire. It is, of course, as he says, a Liberal Labour Council, and Conservatives are proposing a lower community charge. My right honourable friend... My right honourable friend, the Secretary of State, has said that if councils persist in charging excessively high public expenditure, he will not hesitate in general to, to charge cap them, but I cannot give any undertaking with regard to any particular council, because my right honourable friend must wait until all of the charges are set, and then consider the matter, and then decide and make up his own mind. Mr. Kinnock! Is the... Uh... Is the Prime Minister aware that yesterday in the House, her right honourable friend, the Secretary of State for Energy, told members that household electricity prices will rise in the range from 8 to 9 percent, with perhaps two or three boards increasing their charges by a higher percentage? Can she tell us how this will help in the fight against inflation? Yeah. Mr. Speaker, as the right honourable gentleman is aware, those price increases come after a period during which the real price of electricity has gone down very substantially. Indeed, the real reduction of 8% that domestic customers have enjoyed over the last five years has to be taken into account. But I really must take the right honourable gentleman to task. Under the last Labour government, electricity prices went up by 2% every six weeks. Can I Mr. Speaker. Can't the Prime Minister get it through her head that it's the bills that people are faced with now that really bother them and, and that she is blamed for most of those bills? If she can't answer the question I asked her first, will she tell us? Does she think the 13% increase in water charges, the 13% increase in rail fares or the 50% increase in mortgage repayments are help in the fight against inflation? Mr. Speaker, when the Right Honourable Gentleman raised these matters with me before, I pointed out that both in water and electricity, we were requiring higher standards for environmental reasons. For environmental reasons, I said that of course if people required higher standards, it would mean higher expenditure, and the Right Honourable Gentleman then quite agreed that higher standards would mean higher prices. Why does he disagree now? Mr. Speaker, perhaps, uh, perhaps, the, perhaps the Prime Minister can tell us, in view of the fact that she's so interested in recent history, why it is that such huge increases are necessary after all the time she's had in power when plainly a great deterioration took place. In fact, the real price of electricity has gone down in recent years. Since privatization, the real price of gas has gone down. Since privatization, the real price of British telecoms has gone down. So I'm really rather proud of it. But is the right honourable... But is the right honourable gentleman now saying that he's going to drop all, all efforts at increasing the... In that he's going to drop all... Is the right honourable gentleman? The Prime Minister. The right honourable gentleman saying that he is the right honourable gentleman saying that he's going to drop all support and all policy for environmental improvement? Because that's what his question implies. Sir Marco 
Angus Fox, uh, would my, would the, would the Prime Minister, would the Prime Order. Sir Marcus Fox, would the Prime Minister agree with me, in spite of the embarrassment to the leader of the opposition, that the House should welcome the triumph of democracy in Nicaragua? Yeah. Yes, Mr. Speaker, I think once again the Right Honourable Gentleman was on the wrong side. I congratulate Mrs. Tomorrow on becoming President of Nicaragua. It was a splendidly fought, it was a splendidly fought, splendidly fought campaign, and the people turned out the Ortega Socialist Government, and I wish Mrs. Tomorrow well. Hillary Armstrong. The Honourable Lady, to the reply which I gave some moments ago. Hillary Armstrong. Speaker, will the Prime Minister confirm that if local education authorities spend to the limits that uh, she has set down in her poll tax demands, then they will in fact have to lose teacher jobs to the tune of tens of thousands of teacher posts, and that the nation's children's education will suffer? Is she happy to contemplate that prospect? Is she asking that they follow her example and that of many of her friends and abandon state education and say they're not bothered about it? No, Mr Speaker, the Honourable Lady is assuming that the more money you spend on education, the better education is. Alas, I'm afraid... Alas, I'm afraid that is not the case. The highest spending authority in this country is Ilya, and it has the worst education. Yeah. Uh, David Frederick. I defer my honourable friend for the reply which I gave some moments ago. Mr. Frederick. Is my right honourable friend aware that President Menem of Argentina has said of her and her government that he has nothing but the highest respect? <laughs> can only be saved through a process of rapid privatisation. And would she not agree with me that this offers great opportunities to British companies? Uh, Mr Speaker, I am sure those are the right policies. Whether they can be put into effect in the Argentine, I think, is another matter. There are great problems there at the moment. As my honourable friend knows, we have just restored we have just restored diplomatic relations with the Argentine, and I hope and believe that trade relations will now be stepped up, and the people who had interests there before will continue them. But that will necessitate the uh, Argentines getting down their enormous rate of inflation, because it will be impossible to invest until that comes down. The David Hinchcliffe, before Mr. Speaker. I refer the Honourable Gentleman to reply which I gave some moments ago. Mr Hinchcliffe. Can the Prime Minister honestly defend the expenditure of over £100 million in this financial year on allowing hospitals to opt out at the same time as health authorities across the country are facing huge deficits and making cuts and closures? Is she aware of the fact that the Treasurer of the Wakefield District Health Authority, Mr Ray Corner, has just been sacked because he refuses to allow the use of public money on whining and dining those concerned with the opting out process at a time when there are dangerously low nurse staffing levels in Wakefield Health Authority. Will she set up an inquiry into this matter? Mr Speaker, with regard to the first part of the Honourable Gentleman's question, self-governing hospitals are not opting out of the health service in any way. They are, they are a part they are a part of the health service. They are a part of the health service being much more in charge of how to run their own hospital and taking their own decisions and in fact if they choose to work harder and take more patients receiving increased income. But I must point out to the Honourable Gentleman that no hospital can in fact become self-governing until the bill before the House has gone through so at the present there is no such thing. Mr Spencer Baptiste. Number five, sir. 
I refer my honourable friend to, to the reply which I gave some moments ago. Mr. Batiste, whilst German unification must necessarily be primarily a matter for the German people, can my right honourable friends confirm that the natural and legitimate concerns of many other countries can be best delayed if the German government were to take an early opportunity to confirm its acceptance of its post-war boundaries? Mr. Speaker, I, I agree with my honourable friend. When the Polish Prime Minister came on an official visit to this country, he was most concerned about the Poland's boundaries and that they should be guaranteed by treaty. He felt that the Helsinki Accord was not sufficient, nor were assurances sufficient that, that Poland really was entitled to have her boundaries guaranteed by treaty, and we fully support him, and I hope that that will come about, and an assurance that it would, would be very good in the meantime. Mr. Ashton! Speaker, having last week blamed Conservative councils, <laughs> Mr. Speaker... Oh. Mr. Ashton! Mr. Speaker, having last week blamed... Order! 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 Mr. Paddy Ashton. Mr. Speaker, having last week blamed Conservative councils for the poll tax, will the Prime Minister this week condemn Conservative peers who have described her student loan screen as crazy? Why is it that she believes that the best way to encourage young people into higher education is to first saddle them with a burden of a loan? Yeah. Mrs. Baker, the student loans bill has passed through this house and gone to the other place. As the right honourable gentleman is, or should be aware, all educational tuition costs are free. All of them. The only maintenance, the, the only grant goes for maintenance and there is a topping up loan for maintenance. But all education remains free. And for many young people who are not able to get a parental contribution to their grant, even though they would be entitled to it, it will be very helpful to get the best value loan which is on offer anywhere in the country. Mr. David Wiltshire. Number six, sir. I have my own friend to reply which I gave some moments ago. Mr. Wiltshire, can my right honourable friend confirm that since 1948 doctors have had the right to refuse patients onto their lists? Does she agree with me that it's totally wrong for a few general practitioners to be using the excuse of a new contract to refuse patients' admission to their lists? Yeah, yeah, yeah. Will she join me in condemning the cruel and misleading campaign being run by a daily newspaper which seems to be aimed at frightening patients into opposing that new contract and will she also join me in calling on the Labour Party to, to disown that campaign? Yes, Mr Speaker, I join my honourable friend. First, there are now more doctors, general practitioners, than there were some years ago in the health service and therefore their lists are considerably smaller than they used to be. Yeah, yeah. Secondly, the new contract deliberately gives a bigger capitation fee for vulnerable patients and in fact doubles the amount, nearly doubles the amount for each patient, age 75 or over. And thirdly, it doubles the payments for night visits which the GP himself undertakes. Therefore, it is a very, very good contract which I hope most GPs will welcome. I know that some GPs are in fact putting people off their own contracts, as my honourable friend says, something they have been able to do since 1984, and I was very pleased to see that the BME have said that they regard such action by general practitioners as unacceptable. The Lost House! What, a, what advice would the Prime Minister give to education authorities like my own in Wakefield that if they are going, have to be di dictated to by the standard spending assessment would mean a reduction in education spending of 22%. This is equivalent of 850 teachers in my area. Who is going to teach our children? Yeah. Yeah. No, Mr. Speaker, the maximum amount spent on education does not mean the very best education. We learned that many years ago. The standard, the standard assessment makes a, a reason. Makes a order. Order. 
order. The Prime Minister must have a chance to give her answer. The spending assessment gives a reasonable amount to be spent on education, which will provide extremely good education for our children, provided it is managed well and run well by the local education authority. Mr. Quentin Davis. Number seven, sir. I refer my honourable friend to the reply which I gave some moments ago. Mr. Quentin Davis. Will my right honourable friend not agree that despite the very positive reforms introduced during her administration, recent events have made it very clear that the British trade union movement has a long way to go before it can be considered either democratically accountable to its members or free of manipulation by political extremists? Yeah. Mr. Speaker, I agree that there is still quite a long way to go. There is a new trade union bill coming before this House which will give every union member the right to complain to the certification officer or to the court if he believes that a union is acted unlawfully. We shall continue our reform of trade union movement. We believe it has been very beneficial to the ordinary members of trade unions. Yes. Private notice.